Father in heaven, thank you for the community of uh, faith uh, that we can call ourselves family, that you are our father and we are brothers and sisters. And God, I thank you that you have given us your spirit to unite us together, one body, uh, one household, uh, one family, one community, and you're the head of it. Uh, Lord God, today, wherever we are, uh, whenever we're watching this, would your word in your spirit's power um, inspire our hearts and our minds to live a life that is worthy of the name of Jesus. Grant us understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, now let's get your copy of the scriptures, and I want you to open up with me to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be getting back into the storyline of Acts in a couple weeks. But before we do that, uh, I want us to take the theme that we're considering in the book of Acts, uh, empowered, uh, living a life in the spirit, to be bold witnesses and merciful neighbors. And I want us to step back out of the book of Acts. We can be like the first believers in the early church. We can be bold witnesses. We can be merciful neighbors. We can see the great grace of God come upon us and transform us, that we would be uh, used by God to extend his grace and his gospel to transform the world around us. But if we're going to be able to be a church like the church in Acts, then we need to be empowered by the same spirit like they were in the book of Acts. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. This is the uh, most succinct and clearest passage in all of the scripture that describes what it's like to live a life that's empowered by the spirit. So that's what we want to do over these next few weeks. Answer the question, how? How can we live lives that are empowered by the Spirit. This week is going to be kind of like the pre-flight check of our journey. Rather than going verse by verse through a section of Romans 8, we're going to kind of um, look at the themes that are in Romans chapter 8 to get us prepared for the journey. And because it's so rich and so comforting and so inspiring, I want us to start our time in God's Word today by reading a large portion of this text. I'm going to read Romans chapter 7, verse 24, to Romans chapter 8, verse 30. So make sure your copy of Scripture is in front of you, and follow along as I read this. This is God's Word. It speaks to us today, and this is what it says. Romans 7, 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit Set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. But anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, 
not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Fellow heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Grown inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but... The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. How can we be empowered by this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ that dwells in us, brothers and sisters? Well, today, in order to answer that ultimate question, we're going to ask three questions that precede it. We're going to ask, who is this spirit? We're going to ask, why do we need his power? We're going to ask, what does an empowered life look like? And then finally, we're going to ask, how can we be empowered by the spirit? So first, who is the spirit? There's a lot of confusion about this uh, person who is member of the Trinity. But I'd invite you to look together at Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, and notice how Paul uses the Spirit together in interaction with the Father and with Christ, the Son, verse 16. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, the Father. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God's and fellow heirs with Christ, the Son, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Christianity holds that the only true living God revealed in the Bible exists as a trinity. One scholar, Wayne Grudem, says, God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God, And there is one God. So who is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God, and he is a person. See, even though we cannot see God, we can interact with God by faith. But the way that we interact with God and relate to God isn't transactional. As I've mentioned previously, it's not like relating to a vending machine. God, the Spirit, is not an impersonal 
emotionless force that merely acts according to the way that we believe he should be programmed. The Holy Spirit, the scripture says, has a mind. The Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit loves. The Holy Spirit grieves. In this way, we see that the Spirit relates to us dynamically. He acts. We react. We act. He reacts. Think of the relationships that are closest with you, those that are most life-giving. They're not pre-programmed, transactional. Think about your spouse and, and your wife and your work friends who you can only see over video conferencing right now. We act, they react. They act, we react. It's dynamic and it's life-giving. And that's the same with the Spirit who is a person. He's a dynamic person, but the Spirit is also God. And this is encouraging for us. Because in relationship with him, we may be faithless. We may react to to his leading in uh, ignorance or in willful disobedience. But he stays the same. We change, but the spirit is God as the son is God and as the father is God. All of the attributes of the father and the son. He Omniscience, he's all-knowing. Omnipresence, he is all-present omnipotence, he is all-powerful, omnibenevolence, benevolence, he is all-good. All of these attributes that are, are rightly understood to be attributed to the Father and the Son are equally um, in the Spirit as well. And here's why this is important. Since the Spirit is God, he is great enough to supply everything our soul needs. Since the Spirit is a person, he knows us enough and cares about you enough to supply and give you what you need and give it to you when you need it, when you call upon him and walk in harmony with him. This is who the Spirit is. Not some impersonal, emotionless force, but God, a person that we can dynamically interact with. So then, our second question would look like, if, if we are interacting with him and we are empowered by him, what then does an empowered life look like? Wayne Grudem, who gave us our definition of the Trinity, explains five ways, uh, five ways that the Spirit dynamically empowers us. Uh, the Spirit gives us spiritual life. He equips us for spiritual service. He changes and transforms us to reflect in our character and conduct and in our inner being the likeness of Christ. He enlightens and teaches our minds. He unifies the church. Romans 8, though, I would say summarizes three unique ways that he gives life, that he gives spiritual life to us. And I hope these are encouragement to you. Romans 8 highlights that when we are living a life empowered by the Spirit, we can have vitality, we can have assurance, and we can have hope. And man, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of that right now. Vitality. Vitality is living an animated life. Life, a vigorous life, an abundant life, no matter what the circumstances, because the Spirit is living His life through us. Romans 8 says that we can have life and peace. Romans 8 says that we can know that we are pleasing to God. Romans 8 says that there's a way that we can bury those bad habits that rob our life so that we can live even greater liveliness and vitality than we did before. Vitality. The Spirit says that we can have assurance also when we live a life empowered by him. Assurance is this sense of confidence. Confidence that isn't uh, faked to make other people look like I have it all together. Confidence that gives me a quiet and peaceful soul. Knowing that my dignity is secure and my purpose is defined. Romans 8 says that because of the Spirit, we can have the assurance to know that we are not condemned. 
Romans 8 says that we can know that we, by the Spirit, are liberated from fear. That we are adopted as children of God who loves us. And as the scripture says, that nothing can separate us from that love. Christian, even though you may lack it, you can have that assurance today from the Spirit. Vitality, assurance, and also Romans 8 says that the, sure, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers us with hope. Hope is the expectation that things will get better because God keeps his promises. Man, don't we need Romans 8 verse 18 right now? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. A lot of suffering we're going through right now. And it's heavy. But this present suffering isn't worth speaking in the same breath as the awesome hope of glory that we have promised to us. Romans 8 says that even though we can recognize that the suffering of this life is real and it's not diminished, it just can't be compared to what's waiting for us. Vitality, assurance, hope. Christian, does your life show the evidence of the power of the Spirit in the way that you're living today? It might not. And that's okay. Because even if we have been faithless, even if we have been distant from the Spirit, he hasn't been distant to us. We may react and act in ways that ignore him and turn from him, but God has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. The person, God the Spirit, is near to you even now. In university, I was able to meet some, uh, uh, had the privilege to meet some well-known Christian leaders. And there was one woman that I met who was an author, and the way that she lived, Mark, and I only was around her for a few hours, the way that she lived put, made a lasting impression on me. Being around her was like I finally walked out of the desert of the cold, dark Arctic and finally walked into a spring of life where there is a warm fire that gives life. Whenever I was around her, it was just, it was remarkable and it was only for a short time and I would have known it, known it then, but when I look back now, the reason that her livelihood was so warm and so comforting and gave so much light was because the fire that was in her was the presence of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if you've met anyone like this. And whenever you're around them, you're just, you're warmed by their presence. You finally feel like you see after you've been in the dark. Maybe you've seen this in others, but I wonder, do you see it in yourself? You can. The light and the warmth of the fire of the Spirit's presence isn't for well-known Christians on platforms with their names on books and publishing deals. It is the it is the inheritance of every single child of God. But maybe right now you feel like you're lost in the cold darkness and you don't have vitality, you're living in weariness. You don't have assurance, you're uh, feeling apathetic. You don't have hope, you're feeling rather despairing and hopelessness. Life might feel like that. But I would, I would encourage you to trust the promises of God. The life of an empowered by the Spirit is not too far out from you. Even though you might feel like you're a shattered saint. Sure, you're a saint, but life just feels shattered and irreparable. Even though you feel like you are just lost in a fog, you have no way where you're going, and you don't know where up from down is or north from south, the life of the Holy Spirit is not far out from you. Believe in the promises, believe in the promises of Scripture, and you can live a Holy Spirit empowered life. You can live a Galatians 2.20 life. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
You can live a Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 life, which says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works through you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. You can see God live through you. You can see Christ in you when we are empowered by the Spirit. It's not too far off from you, but maybe you've chosen to be far off from him. Listen to his voice spoken in his word, applied to your life. Come back, you belong to him. Some of you might object, though, and say, well, if people are living like that, they're just not trying hard enough. I'm a Christian. I, I'm, I have this vitality. I have this assurance. I have this hope. And if you don't, you're, you need to try harder. Others who are unchurched might think about religion and say, it's like, Listen, you have your book and you have your little support group community thing because you're just weak. And religion is just a crutch for the weak. Maybe that's what you think. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. And unquestionably, the Apostle Paul was the hardest working and most disciplined human who lived in the first century and maybe, maybe any century. So disciplined, so vigorous, such a strong work ethic. He traveled through the entire known world almost on his own dime and took a message by the Spirit's power that started in one central city and brought it across the Mediterranean all the way to Rome. And in his wake, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were changed and economies were transformed because of the message that he preached. He even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I worked harder than them all. But he admits, it was not me, but the grace of God that is through me. See, this hard-working, disciplined man understood something about himself that caused him to recognize that he could not live by his own power and he needed the power of the Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 7 verse 24 again with me. And you'll see a window into how Paul viewed himself and into how God sees us. The Apostle Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? See, the Apostle Paul was the hardest working guy you could ever meet. But he still felt that he was a captive. That he needed to be set free. Why did he feel like that? Well, look at verse 18 of chapter 7. He says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability, not the power to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do is what I keep on doing. Maybe you feel like that. We've all at some time in our lives, made promises to ourselves that we would make life better and not kept those promises. See, like the Apostle Paul, we're all captives in different degrees in different ways. Sometimes we're captive to things that are respectable. Sometimes we're captive to things that are taboo and shameful. But like the Apostle Paul, we've all made are captive to the promises that we've made to ourselves that we're just not able to keep. Like I said, some of them are taboo. Some of them, if people found out, would put a lot of shame on us. We've promised and made promises to ourselves that we'd finally stop using that escort service. We've promised to ourselves that we'd finally stop self-medicating. Some promises we make to ourselves are respectable, We know that they're inconvenient and that there are some consequences, but we make promises to uh, spend less time working and spend more time with family. But another quarter has passed and another budget year is gone and we're still spending the same hours at work. We've promised that we'd make healthy choices and that we would eat better and work out, but we're still at a weight that we know our doctor has said is unhealthy and we're still on a trajectory that we're going to see our uh, body work against us. Okay, but you might think, are you sure? I know I've made promises to myself that I've not kept, but that doesn't make me a captive. 
Are you sure? The Apostle Paul knew that he was a captive because of what he felt. Not just because of the failure to do something, but because of what it made him feel when he failed. His inability to do what he wanted to do made him say, as it said in verse 24, wretched. That's not a word we often use in daily life. But really it, it describes a miserable life. A pitiful life. A life that he knows in his psyche that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. We try to cover it up, we try to hide it, but we might think to ourselves, I'm not captive to my failures, I'm not captive to the things I can't do, but others in your life probably see it differently. Others see your workaholism. Others, others see it expressed in fits of anger. Others see it expressed in hopeless escapism. Others see it expressed in anxious fretfulness. And when others see it, you might try, we might try and mask it and hide it, as I do. But when others see it, they say, they say to us, why can't you just let that go? And it's because we're captives. But Paul knows that the problem is worse than you actually realize it. It's not that we're just captive to the promises that we can't make to ourselves, but we're captives to the law of God that no one of us can ever meet. Yes, we have our own standard that we can't meet, but even worse than that, God has a standard of morality and of good life that none of us could meet. See, remember what the Spirit offers. The Spirit offers a life in his power of vitality and assurance and hope. This comfort, this security, only comes in, in relationship with him. Similar to the comfort and security that you would find in a loving and faithful marriage. Yes, we wrong each other, but when we are faithful to each other and we keep in step with each other, the product of that relationship is this comfort and this security. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. He gives vitality. He gives assurance. He gives hope. Those are products of a dynamic relationship with God. But the reason that we don't have that isn't that we fall short of our standard, it's that we fall short of God's standard and we have broken relationship with him. Because we've broken relationship with God, we are, we feel our captivity and the miserable, pitiful anxiousness that we live in our failures. Now, this might make you feel a lot of despair. This might make you feel shame. And I'll honest, be honest and say, this is what I can feel a lot too. Maybe this is what you felt that time when you had a falling away with that relationship. When you thought the marriage could reconcile, but it couldn't. When someone who you consider to be your best friend wouldn't have anything more to do with you and you felt so alone. But I would say, if you feel, when you look at your own failures, that this might be the way that God looks at you, it isn't. God looks at us differently. Even in our failings, are you able to believe that God still loves you? You can because of what he has promised in his word. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, the cross is proof that even in our failings, God still loves us. See, the Son of God lived in every way that we couldn't, but he suffered every pain that we deserved. This is the way that we are liberated. We can't meet God's standard Christ did. We fall short and deserve to serve a sentence of guilt, but Christ did in our place. And we can be set free from our captivity to sin, set free from the demands of God's law and from the expectations we put on ourselves to live in united relationship with the Spirit and His power rather than depending on ourselves and our own power anymore. 
We will be set free from sin when we believe that Jesus lived the life we couldn't and died the death that we deserve. This liberates us from the demands that we cannot meet. Christ fulfilled the demands. Christ suffered the guilt. And by faith in him, we are free. And we are united with the Spirit and we can live in his power. Faith is the place where we start to live a life that's empowered by the Spirit. Faith in Christ. Believe in him today and you will be set free. You will be united with his presence. You will be welcomed into a dynamic, loving, grace-filled, faithful relationship. And as a byproduct of walking in that relationship, God can produce in your life vitality and assurance and hope. Is this the life that you want? Well, then we need to ask one final question. How? This is the ultimate question. If we have a relationship with the Spirit, how can we be empowered by the Spirit? We'll simply say it like this. We will be empowered by the Spirit when we learn to cooperate with the Spirit. We will be empowered by the Spirit when in relationship with Him, we learn to cooperate with Him. Life in the Spirit is not learned by sitting in a classroom. It's an on-the-job, hands-on apprenticeship with a master tradesman who shows us what a real, true, abundant humanity looks like. And Romans 8 is our guidebook. Romans 8 describes the way that we cooperate with the Spirit and join into apprenticeship with him. And this is what we're going to journey over over the next three weeks. We're going to see the, the six ways that we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit to see him empower us to live a life of vitality and hope and assurance. When we are set free by the Spirit through faith in Jesus, we can cooperate with him by learning to live in him and walk in him, by learning to set our minds on him, by burying our sin that robs our life in his power, by being led by him in love, by hoping through him even in our suffering, and by praying in him in our weaknesses. This is the dynamic relationship in unity with the Spirit. And when we are a people empowered by the Spirit, we can be a community that is empowered by the Spirit. And we can be marked by the transforming grace of God like the community in Acts was. We can be bold witnesses to an onlooking world. We can have a life of vitality, assurance, and hope that shines the light of Christ into the darkness. And we can when we have faith in Jesus. We can when we cooperate with the Spirit and learn in apprenticeship with him.